Again, what, what attracts us to this ministry and this partnership is just this love for the people in their city. I love to say we, we see there's poverty, there's hurt, there's crime, there's people who are turning uh, to life-destructive things just to find hope. And they said, and, and really God has given a vision uh, to say we want to bring hope to our city through, through these centers. So we, we, we're grateful for that. And uh, so thank you for all the work you have done and, and for that. So this morning, I just want to introduce you uh, quickly. This is uh, Pastor Salinga and, uh, and his wife, Colleen, uh, Claudine. And then a translator at the end there, we have Jeff, who's all the way from Mission Viejo, and, uh, <laughs> but who grew up in Kinshasa in, uh, in the DR Congo and actually uh, knew uh, Salinga's father when he was living there as a child. And so, I mean, actually, his father knew Salinga as he was living there as a child. And so they have this kind of uh, bond, and he's here to do some, although they both speak English perfectly, much better than they think, but uh, they are, will mostly speak in Lingala for us today. So those of you who don't need a translator, go at it. So, um, but we, not only do you uh, partner with these um, Tabitha centers, but a lot of, some of your work is just training and raising up pastors to multiply disciples and, and to reach others. You want to tell us a little bit about maybe one story about how that's working for you in there as well. Thank you, Pastor. Before, I want uh, to thank you on behalf of my wife and myself. Even we are partner, but thank you for your support. And uh, thanks for sharing the same dream to impact uh, people alive in the world. Um, we have many stories how God transform and how God impact the life of people, even the leaders. But I have only one I will share with you. Um, Tango Nyo, so to do series of formation about pastor. Uh, oftentimes we finish up our training sessions. To tuna kabango ko pesa biso, ndengeni ni formation sa isi bango. We ask them, what has been the benefit of this training session for you? It's important to note that approximately 80% of the people who come to these training sessions have no formal uh, seminary or education in scripture. And there's one uh, pastor in particular I want to talk about. His name is Godé. So the coursework that he went through was basically uh, preaching and uh, how to uh, share God's word. Uh, basically, he stood up and shared with the group that uh, after he returned home and he preached at his church, his wife, uh, who often can be extremely critical of the husband, uh, came up to him and said, I can't believe how great that was. You're actually preaching God's word now for the first time. And so he really realized that he uh, was being fulfilled and was doing what he was called to do. And consequently, the church there started to grow. And it's a direct result of the training he got uh, in our center. And indirectly, it came from you, because you're helping with the resources so that they can have the training and obviously impact Mr. Godet. So here's just one example how your work and your resources have helped impact one person, which obviously has impacted numerous around him. So the church has grown from 200 now up to 300 members. Merci, me. Thank you. Yeah. That's great, yeah. You know, it's, it's, sometimes it's those little things, those small things that maybe we think are insignificant that God wants to use, and he, he's changing and multiplying lives in so many ways. It's exciting. So I want you to share just one, you know, a, a, a lot is going on, but what's a dream for what's next? What's, what are some of the things coming up uh, that we can be praying for and aware of for, for your ministry? Pray for us and for wisdom. That's the number one. 
we want to start many ministries in Kinshasa. One hand the gospel initiative. Now we are just four ministries. But we want also to start something like Tabitha for the boys in Kinshasa. Um, Tabitha do the great job, great work to transform a girl, girl life. But many boys come to us and ask, so about us? Can you start something for us? So since God, God now press us or ask us to do something for a boy in Kinshasa. So we want to start, but we need also the God direction. So join us in prayer for that. Thanks. Okay, great. Definitely. We'll be praying as they look to expand what they're doing for the girls. They want to do a lot. For, there's a lot of boys in the same situation. Yeah. Um, you, you've gotten off the hook. You haven't shared anything with us yet. So I'm going to ask you one question and just what's something specifically we can be praying for you. Uh, again, just pray for wisdom for us as we uh, tackle our work out there and just uh, pray for our entire city. Great. Well, we, and they are at the end of, of really, they've been in the States for seven weeks away from some of their children and I've uh, been kind of tired, so this is their last stop. We've been trying to give them rest this weekend. And uh, we do want, we're just grateful that you could take the time to encourage us. I think uh, next hour they're going to hang out with some of our high schoolers as well, which is cool. So let's just, let, let's pray for them. Join with me as we pray just God's blessing on their lives. God, we thank you so much, so much for the way that you are using people across the globe for your glory, for your kingdom. And God, we thank you this morning for Selinga and for Claudine for their hearts, for the vision you've given to them, for the, uh, the call on their lives and that you've filled them with your spirit. Now we pray, Lord, that you'd give them wisdom on what are the next steps forward. And Lord, as they go back to the DR Congo, they don't go back alone, but they go with all of us in our hearts with them, as our friends and our partners living overseas, that we are with them. And in spirit, and God, we are asking your power and spirit in their lives as they love their city. They love Kinshasa to change it and see people's lives transformed for your name. We thank you for them now. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's give them a hand again. And, and they also, they do have uh, prayer cards that are in the back. So on the way out, if you want to be reminded of uh, to pray and how you can pray, uh, they do have those on the way out. And please stop by in between services and say hello to them. Well, let's jump right into the text here today. We are uh, doing something a little different. We're in the middle of a series called God of Our Fathers. And again, what we have been celebrating is we've been uh, and studying is we're studying the story of how God is interacting, uh, has interacted with people from the very beginning and to reveal his name and his character and then how people respond. And, and as we look at this, we're studying the God of Our Fathers. And we've been looking through stories in the book of Genesis. Now, this morning, we're taking a little detour. And uh, we, we thought it was appropriate because um, midweek this week, actually on Halloween, it marked the 500th anniversary of what many people consider the beginning of what is called the Protestant Revo uh, Reformation. And what that was was uh, 500 years ago, uh, a man named Martin Luther uh, posted this thesis called the 95 Thesis on the door of a, of a cathedral, on Wittenberg's door is what it's known as now, and it was meant to stir a debate, to say, let's talk about maybe some ways that the church, and this is when we start talking about the church, we mean the big C church, the gathering, the global gathering of Christians, has kind of lost its way. And, and that, what he intended to spark was a debate among scholars and say, hey, where have we lost our way and lot, kind of veered off course? And what it actually ended up leading to is what we now know as what's called the Protestant Re uh, Reformation. Why am I having trouble with that word today? And uh, this morning what we thought we would do is uh, it's important that every once in a while we'd kind of look back and say, well, because it's the 500th year anniversary, it, it seemed appropriate that 500 is a big number. It's a big birthday. And so we thought we'd look at what are some of the things that came out of this that we still hold to today that are really important. So that's what we're going to do today. It is still God of our fathers. And when we talk about our fathers, we're talking about our forefathers, the men and women of faith, the thinkers, the people who have been uh, trying to find their way, exploring, explain God from the beginning. 
And and so as we're studying their God, we thought we'd just jump 1,500 or 2,000 years ahead from where we have been to 500 years ago and look at some of the forefathers and some of the thoughts that they came up with that still apply to us today. And I thought this was an appropriate detour. The reason I think it's an appropriate detour and what we're going to look at today are things called the five solas. And these weren't, Martin Luther didn't write these. This is just a collection of when they looked at all the ideas that came out, it was these. Now, sola is a, a Latin word that essentially means alone or only. And there's sometimes that we as people, I believe, as I've been looking and thinking about this, we have a tendency to take something and like to add to it and keep making it what we think might be better and better or tweaking it just a little bit. Uh, my wife and I just got back from vacation. We went up to New England on a vacation because we wanted to go up and experience fall weather. You know, the leaves are changing, and, and uh, it's, it's pretty hard when you're from San Diego and you explain to somebody in, like, northern Vermont, oh, why are you up here? Like, oh, we just wanted to come to get some cold weather. And they kind of stare at you like, what is wrong with you people? Um, but so we went up there to kind of experience. We love the fall, so we wanted to go there and experience all that. Now, New England has everything that we fake down here for fall, right? You walk through the woods and you smell these leaves and all the smells. Now, we make candles that are called like fall leaves, trying to emulate it. Um, it, It's all about up there. There's maple trees everywhere. So everything, they're tapping their own trees, making maple syrup. And there's this this flavor of maple on everything. There's there's apple harvest going on now. So you have apple spice and and apple cider everywhere. And um, pumpkins that grow you know, in the cold, not on the, you know, in the heat and, and some pumpkin patch that has like bounce houses. It's actually pumpkin patches. And so, um, it has pumpkin spice is it, we put pumpkin spice in everything so we can feel like it's fall. Right. And we actually, at one morning it was, we had one day, it was like 70 degrees and we looked over, we were at breakfast and two people came down. They looked like they were from San Diego and they had beanies on and their kid was all bundled up. We're like, oh, they're totally from San Diego. And they just, they know it's fall. So they dress like fall. That's us. Right. So, but we were there and experiencing all this. But one of the things my wife and I love about travel is the food part of it. We're big foodies. We love cooking. We love experimenting. And uh, so we had a lot of, we had one meal where you didn't even get to order. You just, you paid. And the chef came out and said, hey, I went to this farm, bought this, this farm, bought that. And so now this is what I'm going to make for you. And, and it was really cool. But then we went to this other place that was this kind of cool bar and grill. And we had been hiking all day in the rain. We were hiking parts of the Appalachian Trail. Um, watching real hikers come down while we were just sitting there like, hey, taking pictures with our big camera. And, um, but that night, we, I just wanted something comfort. I wanted like a pizza. And we went in this place and they had a wood fire grill where they made individual pizzas. And like pepperoni pizza in Mountain Dew is just comfort food, right? Because it's, it's biblical. It's what, it was actually in the Garden of Eden. It wasn't a fruit. It was a pizza. And so um, it, it was, it, so that's all I kind of wanted. And we're looking at this menu and the chef was, was, thinking he's unique and creative. And so he had this individual pizza that was bacon and blue cheese and maple. I know. I don't know why, but I said, oh, that sounds interesting. And, and, and so I tried it. I said, I'll try that. And I asked the waiter, like, what, what do you think about this? And he said, well, it's unique. And, um, <laughs> and I thought, oh, that sounds great. Unique is great. So I ordered this individual pizza with this, this maple bacon. I mean, who doesn't like bacon when it's in your maple syrup, right? I mean, that's good. And so I thought this will be good. I ordered the pizza. And I take one bite and immediately what I realized was I would not be comforted that night. <laughs> and that the other thought that crossed my mind was there's just some things you don't need to mess with. <laughs> there's just some things like just leave it alone. It's already good. The American version of pizza is it's this way for a reason because it's good (laughs) and so when you take maple and put bacon on it and all this like great idea but you didn't make it better (laughs) and sometimes by adding two things we take away from them And, and we as people like to add to things trying to find how can we improve it how can we make it better but sometimes when we add we take away and really what happened here 500 years ago In this Reformation, the way it began is the church fathers were looking at this and saying, where have we gone off course? It seems that we have added to the things that we should be believing and committed to, and we've added and added until now what we've actually done is we're taking away. We're taking away from how it should be. And so now everything is divided. This is just a generalization down to what we call the five So we're going to look at those today, and we're going to kind of speed through them. 
But I thought it was worthwhile. So let's look at these. What are the things that we don't need to add to? When we add to it, that it actually takes away. One of them, the first one we're going to look at today is this idea called sola scriptura. And it means in scripture alone. And that's the Latin word, uh, the Latin phrase for, for scripture alone. Meaning that the scriptures are God's highest authority and nothing else should be the authority other than scripture. And what that means is that your priests, your pastors, the pope, the, uh, you, uh, the televangelists, your favorite celebrity, Hollywood producers, they are not your final authority of what truth is in this world. That's good news, is it not? Your politicians are not your final authority. But what came out of this was in Scripture alone, we find our highest authority. The writers of Scripture, of, of, of the Bible, we believe are humans that are explaining their way, but they're under the inspiration of God. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, 16 is Paul's writing about it and he says all the scriptures and at that time he's referring to the Hebrew scriptures later the church fathers adopted that to be all scripture what we have today is inspired by God and it's useful for correcting for teaching for training and rebuking and righteousness and this is our highest authority so anytime we find ourselves saying things like well this verse it says this and I kind of think it probably means this or well that writer didn't understand 2017 culture in San Diego. And so when they said this, well, it probably means this today. And we try to, we become the highest authority because we have more blog followers, more uh, Instagram hits, or somehow we have a platform that someone gave to us. Or because we wrote books that everyone likes. And we have a tendency to say people can be the highest authority. But we want scripture to be the highest authority. We want to use scripture to interpret scripture. Now there's time, do you ever listen to pastors? I hope so. I know some of you do, some of you nap time, I get it. But, so, uh, but we want to use, we want to learn from other people, but I should never be your highest authority. And that's why here at, in Seacoast we like to say a thing, when scripture speaks, we speak. When it's silent, we want to be silent. We want to let scripture speak for, interpret scripture. When you come to a problem, problem some verse, which you will, if you read through the Bible, you will come to some verses that will make you scratch your head. But we don't want to interpret it based on our whim, based on our preferences, based on what we think it should be. We want to look at other passages. Say, how does scripture interpret itself? It's our highest authority. Now, in order to do that, we, want, we need to be engaged. We need to be reading. But I know for some of you, when you open up the Bible... Maybe you've tried to read it, and you look at it, and you just say, this, I don't, it doesn't really fit. And I, I was looking around, and I found some examples of street signs that I think fit with how some of us look at Scripture. Here's one. Some of you might read the Bible, and you think it's like this, right here. Very limiting. Don't, 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 don't. Some of you think of Scripture, and this is what you think of. I have a friend who's a pastor who, when he became a Christian, or before he became a Christian, his dad said, don't get involved in religion because it's going to make your world too small. And some of us think of this as this is what the Bible is going to do to you. It's going to put parameters on your life and shrink you down to where there's nothing you can do. It's don't, don't, don't. We believe otherwise, but some of us think of it that way. Here's the next thing. It might think, you might read scripture and it looks like this. Too many different instructions. How are you even supposed to, when you're driving by that, how does this even help you understand? How can you read it all? What do you know what's going on? There's just too much coming your way, and you don't even know where to begin. How about this next one? Yeah. <laughs> you, re you read it, and you say, what? This, this is bizarre. <laughs> what do you think happened that made them have to put that sign? <laughs> I mean, I, I know what happened, but why do you think that happened? I came across that, and I thought, okay, so somebody, the employees are sitting around like, you know what we need? We need a sign that says, don't lick these windows. <laughs> Sorry to use that accent if that sounds close to your homeland. I, I, I'm not, not meaning anything by it, but, but yeah, so sometimes we look at Scripture, and we think, I don't even get it. Why did you even have to say this? And then some of you might think of Scripture as this one. Irrelevant. <laughs> How would you like to be driving around down the road and you see that? <laughs> Get pulled over for not following it? I don't know. It's <laughs> Didn't you see the sign back there? Um, anyway. Yeah, some of us look at scripture and we think, 
doesn't apply anymore. This is old. It doesn't work anymore. They don't understand Snapchat, the writers. How could it possibly apply? And some of us look at scripture, and this is how we think of it. Some of you might think that all of these things add up to what it leads to as, as followers of Jesus, if we really follow scripture, is we become these judgmental, hateful people. If we're trying to do all of this, we're out of touch. We don't fit in with culture. I really believe if we take a rightful understanding of scripture and we use it to expand our view of who God is, see how big he is, we understand his character, we understand his love, his grace, his mercy, we understand all that he cares about and his character, that we don't become limited, out of touch, irrelevant people, but actually we become very relevant, loving, accepting people. The author Scott Saul says this, I have the quote for you on the screen. The more conservative we are in our belief that every word of scripture is true, the more liberal we will become in how we love every kind of person. To the degree that we understand how love and forgiven we are, we will be among the least offended and least offensive people in the world. We will also be among the most loving, others-oriented, and life-giving people in the world. You see, reading and understanding and having a robust view of God and his ways and his world and how he loves, how he pours out his grace, how he calls us to be his hands and feet shouldn't make us offensive or even offended by others. Because we learn that the story's not about us, it's about our God. And it gives us the freedom to freely love and be others-oriented, not self-focused, not out of touch. We actually don't have to go around and regulate the morals of our country. Now, we would love the morals of the country to match up with Christianity, but my guess is we keep veering a little further and further off course. But what we're called to do is represent God in his ways. And we can lovingly embrace and, and accept and walk around with people and let God be the one to convict hearts. Let God be the one to transform lives. And the more and more we believe this Bible, the more and more we believe that he's the one who is in charge of that in the first place. And the more we believe this Bible, the more we believe that we don't belong, we shouldn't even be included in. We don't deserve to be a part of his family, but we are. So we are free to love and to accept and extend his grace and goodness to others. The more we believe this, the more free we are to love. We don't become irrelevant. We become very engaged. We become a place that can look at our brothers and sisters. We can look at our neighbors who even reject Christianity and say, we are going to be to we're, hold ourselves a higher calling. We're going to love and we're going to engage in issues like racial reconciliation where maybe others are afraid of because we know ultimately that God has created all people and he loves them. We can have a seat here in this room for those from the LGBTQ community and say, it's not for us to, to say whether you're in or out. We're going to love you and we're going to let Jesus Christ be a part of transforming and, and working in your life. We're going to look at people across the globe, maybe with other faiths, and say, we believe that God loves you, cares about you is inviting you into his story. And instead of lashing out against you, we're going to extend to you with the love and grace of Jesus that someone extended to us. And we believe that God can change and transform lives. That's what we want to be about. And when we anchor our lives in scripture as our highest authority, not our whims, not our emotions, not speakers, not anyone else, but we look at the way scripture describes God and how we're invited to participate with him. It gives us the freedom to truly live this way. So the first one, sola scriptura. All right. Next one. We've got to keep moving. Sola fide. This is in faith alone. Those of you who took Latin in school, you can correct my translations later. So we are saved through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Our lives, we are saved by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and putting our faith in what he has done, not in what we have done. We don't need to add to it. We can't add to it. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, he says, Before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore the law and he's, uh, has become our tutor that leads us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. And this means justified, mean made right in the eyes of God because of our faith in what Jesus has done. But faith has come. We're no longer under this tutor. We're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
We've been given freedom now in Christ and Christ alone. And it's through faith in the work that he has done. We don't need to add to it. No maple syrup on faith. It's easy for us to think that it's faith in the work of Jesus and then faith in my ability to make myself better. Faith in the work of Jesus and faith in my ability to now transform my own life. But it's actually faith in the work of Jesus to transform your life. Faith in the work of Jesus that he will live his life through you. Faith in the work of Jesus that all your sins in the past, present, and future are taken care of. It's faith alone. We don't need to add to it. This came out of it. Related to that is this. The next one is, is solo gratia, and it's grace alone. We are saved by the grace of God alone. This is the idea that uh, by grace you are saved through, for, through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. It is God's unmerited favor that's poured out on you, first and foremost. It's his grace given to you. Grace means that you didn't do anything to earn it. That it came from God first to you. When we understand that it comes from God and God alone, that means that even taking communion or being baptized or in, in the time of the Reformation, buying indulgences and, 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 pay, and praying to saints and all these things we think could get us a better standing in the eternal life, but it is by God's grace alone, not what you have done. It's poured out from him to you. And it begins with God when we understand by grace alone, we know that our lives begin and start with God poured out to us, not the other way around. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it says this, Do you think lightly of the kindness of God? Not knowing that it is the kindness and toler- of God's kindness, tolerance, and patience. Not knowing that the kindness of God is what leads you to repentance. Do you know it's not your repentance that leads to God's kindness? We tend to switch it around sometimes. We think, if only I can come to God with open arms, if only I could come to him and and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'll never do this again. Will you forgive me? Will you be gracious to me? I, I promise I will do this, this, this. But actually, it's God's kindness that comes first. That's what it means by grace alone. It doesn't begin with you. It begins with God. And the church fathers wanted us to understand this. Tim Keller is a pastor in New York City, and he's known to uh, teach in, in, in this really great kind of uh, progressive-type church, reaching a lot of the professionals in Manhattan. And, and he had one lady in his church who was exploring the faith, and she, after one of the sermons about grace alone, she came up to Tim and said this. She said, I- I'm starting to get this, and, and at the time she wasn't yet a Christian, she, and, or didn't claim to be, and she said, okay, if I am saved by works... There is a limit to what God can ask of me. And what she meant by that is, if it is about my works, about what I offer to God, then it wouldn't be fair for God to ask too much of me because he knows my limitations. If it's a transactional relationship with God, if I'm saved by works, then there's a limit to what he can ask of me. Then she said this, but if I'm saved by grace, there is no limit to what he can ask of me. Because if I'm saved by grace, it means I owe him everything. And not owe him in the sense of I have to pay back everything. But it, because I'm saved by grace, it's only fitting for me to give him my whole life. Because it comes from him and him alone. It's a response to a gift. It isn't to earn the gift. It isn't a transaction that we are a part of. It's what God pours out. So when we understand grace alone, it changes the way we look at our lives. That's why we say we want you to experience what it means to understand what God has called you and equipped you and uniquely made you for. Why I'm so excited when I hear a story of God giving a vision to to Claudine in DR Congo and Kinshasa to say, I have a vision for you to love your city and to reach these girls who are living on the street and give them hope. And that vision exploded in her life and she was able to live her life or or able to follow this vision and see hundreds and hundreds of girls experience life in Christ. Every one of us in here, God has shaped you and uniquely created you and has a dream for your life. I don't know what that is. But if we are all turned loose to our schools, to our workplaces, to our neighborhoods, 
to the restaurants that we hang out with here in Encinitas in North County. And if we love our city the way God has placed us here to love our city, and we say, God, what is the dream you have in my life? What is the vision? Because my life is yours because it comes from you. Every, I owe you all because you've given it all freely. It starts with because of your grace, I want to respond. We want to see you experience that. There's nothing more joyful. The next one is this. And I know I'm going through these quickly. You can study on your own throughout the week. We have them in your daily encounters. The next one is this. It's solus Christus. And it's in Christ alone. Jesus Christ alone is our Lord, our Savior, and our King. Jesus Christ alone. We don't need to add to Jesus. No maple syrup on him. We don't need to make it better. But in Christ alone, we have all we need. He is our Lord, our Savior, and King. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In me and me alone, I can give you life with the Father. With that said, I do believe that God's salvation is a mystery. I believe that there's people who live around the globe and maybe have not had the opportunity to really understand who Jesus is, but they have a faith that God would credit to them as righteousness. I don't know how that all works. There's people who've lived in places and never heard the word of Jesus, but God has a way of seeing through the hearts. I still believe that's through Christ and Christ alone. He is the author of salvation. He paid the price for all people in all places, and faith is what saves us, but it's in Jesus alone. No other name can we be saved. The other thing is this, that we are transformed by Christ alone. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. Meaning the life now that I live, the life is not my own, but it's in faith in the one who gave himself up for me. So we are saved by Christ alone, but we are sustained by Christ alone. He is the one now who lives his life in and through us and in Jesus and Jesus alone, no other name. How many of us like to add to Jesus? How many of us say, well, it's Jesus and me? Jesus is my co-pilot. Jesus is, well, it's Jesus needs me to kind of, God will help those who help themselves, right? These are things that we say. But really, it's in Christ and Christ alone. Does God help those who help themselves? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes God helps those who have not a clue what's going on. <laughs> oh, man, yes. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> Martin Luther said this. He said, well, I'm telling you that it's easier for us as humans to believe and to trust in everything else than in the name of Christ Jesus, who alone is in all, who, or who is all in all. It's more difficult for us to rely on him in whom and through whom we possess all things. See, it's difficult for us to trust in Jesus and, and all that he offers. It's easier to trust in ourselves. It's easier to trust in the, our accomplishments. It's easier to trust in even the good things we've done. It's easier to trust in the authority of other people. It's easier to trust in your pastor or your life group. It's easier to trust in your service to our kids and our youth. It's easier to trust in those things because those things kind of are more tangible. They make more sense. And Martin Luther said, it's our way. As humans, we have a tendency to trust in everything, yet in Christ. We like the maple syrup and bacon on our pizza when you have a great pepperoni right there. But we want to keep adding to it. It's our way as humans. And, and he reminded us, no, it's in Christ, in Christ alone. Let us be a church that builds our lives on Jesus and Jesus alone. And the last one is this. It's in God's glory alone. We live for the glory of God alone. What this means is that we don't live so that we can be great. We don't live so that our, our church, Seacoast, can be the best church in the whole country. Do we want God to move in, the, in this community? Yes. Do we want God to use us to transform our city? Yes. Do we want God to use us to bring life to those who haven't experienced life in Christ? We do. But at the end of the day, we want that to turn hearts and lives back to Jesus, not to us. We want to live for his glory. Isaiah writes in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, when he, he has this vision of heaven, and he says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And by the way, a lot of these verses I'm sharing with you today, the reason we, we don't have time to get into them all, they're in your daily encounters. It's an email we send out, or it's in, your, in the bulletins today on the back. You can read all these extra verses. 
But God's, the earth is filled with God's glory, and now throughout Scripture, it talks about this idea that now we as followers of Jesus, when we reflect his character and likeness to others, that's God's glory. There's glory in, his, in creation. We can kind of see characteristics of God, but there's glory as followers of Jesus live out his ways to the world. A way you can glorify God. This sounds like a churchy word, right? Let's glorify God. Essentially, that means put God's character on display. One definition, I have it for you on the screen, is this. The glory of God is the holiness of God put on display. It is the outward radiance of the intrinsic beauty and greatness of his many perfections. That sounds very seminary-ish. I get it. <laughs> but it's the outward glow. It's the outward display of the beauty and greatness of God's perfections. And that is we are called as Christians to put his beauty and greatness on display in our lives. And it's for God's glory alone. That's what we want to live for, not for ourselves. Now, do we receive joy when we live for God's glory? The answer is yes. God wants us to receive joy. God wants us to enjoy him and his presence and enjoy this life. Not in the sense of a, hey, I don't want anything to ever go wrong with you, but to experience this deeper sense of joy and peace that only comes from a life in Christ. This peace in the midst of turmoil. Even as things go wrong, as we've been studying through the book of Genesis and God of our fathers, that there's a deeper joy when it's about God and his call and his mission. I want to invite the worship team to make their way up. And as I said this morning, to start with, this was just an overview. It's intended just to get us thinking. But I want us to think about here as we end our time is what are the things that we tend to add to in our faith? What are the toppings that we want to add to Christ and to grace and to faith? What are the toppings we add to scripture? What are the toppings we add to God's glory and to make it about something other than what it is? When we add to it, we actually take away. What is that for you in your life? Are you here this morning and you feel this heavy weight and burden because you haven't memorized enough verses? Because you haven't prayed well enough? Because... You look at your life and you think, oh, I'm not a good enough Christian. And you're here with a heavy weight this morning. You're adding to what Christ has done for you. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, find rest for your souls. In Christ alone, through faith alone and grace alone, as we learn from scripture alone, we live our lives for God's glory alone. We don't need to add to it. We don't need to add to what Christ has for us.